While the world of on-screen monsters is crowded with CGI and digital animation, there are still some actors who take on the task of bringing the most grotesque and complicated creatures to life. Unlike their film and TV personas, these actors can turn a head or two in real life. Wes Craven has always had a knack for creating dastardly creatures that bring our worst nightmares to life. Character Freddy Krueger did that literally. The slasher film star isn't just a villain, he's a horror institution with disturbing looks to match an equally messed up backstory. The former janitor was burned alive which somehow transformed his mutilated corpse into a demon that could only kill his victims inside of their own dreams. In 2010, the role of the infamous serial killer was taken on by Jackie Earl Haley for the Warner Brothers remake of A Nightmare on Elm Street. I had to keep you awake long enough. So when you finally slept, you'd never wake up again. The Academy Award-nominated actor wasn't a fan of horror when he donned the famous razor glove, but he endured the arduous makeup process to take on the iconic role anyway. He told Bloody Disgusting, You know, I've done a lot of complaining about the makeup because people are asking me that question, but it was well worth it. There was even something just about the arduousness that really helped for the preparation of the character. Yeah, it was a fun process. It was incredibly difficult, incredibly arduous, challenging, physically and just everything. But it was also fun getting in there and playing Freddy Krueger. There's a reason winter took so long to come. Apparently, actually becoming a White Walker takes some serious effort. In an interview with Vulture, Game of Thrones actor Kit Harington revealed his ghostly foes come to life without the use of CGI. The Night King's crown of horns and ominous blue eyes are apparently prosthetics. According to Times of India, it takes a whopping six hours in the makeup chair to transform stuntman slash actor Vladimir Fordik into the White Walker's fearless leader. The transformation is so severe that fans rarely recognize him in real life, and he's shown without makeup in just a single episode over the course of the series. He told Times of India, Not many fans know I'm the Night King because on the show, this face is always behind the mask. It's at events when fans know it's me that they come for autographs and selfies. For Deke, who replaced Richard Brake on Game of Thrones in Season 6, started his career as a stuntman in films like Skyfall and Thor The Dark World. The Shape of Water ended up winning the Oscar for Best Picture largely because it managed to achieve making a giant godly amphibian man into an actual sympathetic character. For Doug Jones, who donned the scaly suit, that was no easy task. The costume alone took three years to create, from a drawing in Guillermo del Toro's sketchbook. Once Jones put it on, it was exceedingly difficult to see, hear and feel. In an interview with Wired, he admitted it left him feeling like, quote, a bit of a nursing home patient. Jones, who doesn't actually have any speaking lines, told Slate that his role was unlike most of his other costume roles. Instead of spending hours in the makeup chair, it was relatively easy to put on. From, from the neck down was a suit. I slipped into it, zipped it up the back, but it was very, very tight and, and snug. It took four people to help me do that. That said, it did pose a major problem when it came to using the bathroom. He dished to Slate, there was no trapdoor in the back. When I'm in the suit, it'll be for a good 16, 17 hours a day. So you have to make sure that you're not going to have a little accident. And that is my biggest fear in this world, is that they're going to pull the suit off me one day and be disgusted by the aroma. Tim Burton cast Helena Bonham Carter in his 2001 Planet of the Apes remake. The actress, who separated from the director in 2014 after a 13-year relationship, has often been described as being Burton's muse. And it might have just been her portrayal of the chimpanzee humanoid Ari that sparked their long-time working relationship. Burton and Bonham Carter first met on the set of the classic remake, in which the star underwent what she called a, quote, cumbersome and crippling makeover. Oh, no. Not you again? You know me. Just can't stand by while human beings are being mistreated, tortured, mutilated. In an interview with Cinema.com, Bonham Carter admitted it took about four hours in the makeup chair to fully get dressed in her, quote, very unpleasant and unbearably hot chimpanzee costume. It was difficult to hear wearing the rubber ears and her furry hands were, in her own words, absolutely useless. The huge teeth also posed a problem. She could only drink through a straw and was forced to use a tiny cosmetic mirror to eat just so she could see where her mouth was. But the worst part was using the bathroom. She admitted, that was 
a huge event in itself and very exhausting. It meant removing your rubber furry hands and then struggling to open your ape suit, so basically we ate and drank as little as possible simply to avoid the incredible logistical problems of going to the toilet. In Netflix's reboot of Lost in Space, the iconic role of the robot was absolutely transformed. In many ways, his complexity and depth are the reasons the show is so captivating. Though there's undoubtedly parts of the upgraded costume that can be attributed to CGI, the main humanoid portrayal is done by actor Brian Steele, who wears a heavy robot suit throughout filming. The robot's face obviously looks nothing like Steele in real life. While Steele can rely on human things like eyebrows and lips to express emotions, the robot only has his color-changing face, which evolved throughout the production. VFX supervisor Jabbar Razani told IndieWire, It started out colorful, but it was distracting. We decided to go with a lava lamp sense where he was a bit more ethereal and almost more mesmerizing as you stared into his face. And then using slower patterns and light seemed to be more effective. But we tried to use color to help show what he was feeling. According to an interview in Popular Mechanics, the entire idea for the sci-fi horror splice was sparked by the real-life image of a lab rat with a human ear growing out of its back. Basically, it was always going to have creepy, genetically mutated creatures from the get-go. Director Vincenzo Natale even worked with a real geneticist while writing the script to make sure things were as realistic as possible. Sure, we may not be growing a dren in the lab anytime soon, we're not touching that ethics violation with a 10-foot pole, but what about in the future? Future. For something so bizarre looking, Dren is actually kind of beautiful. As much as a humanoid with a tail, wings, and triple jointed legs can be. That's largely due to actress Delphine Chenayak's stunning good looks and the fact that it took more than a decade to flesh out. Natalie used designers who came from a fine arts background rather than a film background to create a more realistic movie monster. Natalie told Popular Mechanics, What I wanted to do with Dren in her later stages was to change the human form in subtle ways. I felt the small changes would actually be more shocking than the big ones. If you make a small change to somebody's face, it is much more jarring than some kind of gross deformation. Silent Hill is certainly a creepy video game series, but the movie's real-life scare factor hinged on transforming the intense cast of monsters into actual living, breathing beings. Its success would not have been possible without award-winning choreographer Roberto Campanella, who's worked on film and TV projects like The Shape of Water and The Strain. For Silent Hill, he not only served as creature movement coordinator, yes, that's an actual professional title, but he is also credited as Colin and Red Pyramid, aka Pyramid Head. Though Campanella is an undeniably attractive dancer, Colin was absolutely grotesque. The character was meant to be a former janitor who was tormented by Alessa after he assaulted her. She ultimately killed him and tied him up with barbed wire in the bathroom stall where the attack took place. There wasn't a whole lot Campanella could do choreography-wise to make the character more grotesque considering he was bound in the costume, but he did improvise with facial expressions. In an interview, he revealed, My head is tilted back, so I can't even really move my head that much. The only thing that I could really use to make it obscene was my tongue. And obscene? it was, and definitely on brand for Silent Hill's twisted, sadistic shtick. Andrew Bernarski wasn't the first choice to play the iconic horror movie villain Leatherface in the 2003 remake of The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but it was his beefiness and brawn that landed him the part. Director Marcus Nispel reportedly wanted the biggest guy. In an interview, the former professional bodybuilder admitted he only got the role after the person originally hired lied about his size and physical ability. Bernarski explained, They hired the wrong guy, and then on day one, scene one, take one, he is hospitalized disabled by the intensity of work and is fired. By now, they needed help, and I was raring to roar. I was then asked if I could, would, still like to fly to Austin. I told Marcus, don't worry, I'm your man. I was born to wear the mask. I meant it. He knew it. That's that. Berneski might have been the right person for the part, but he certainly was nothing like his character. Dispelling any possible rumors to the contrary, Berneski insisted to IGN that he never stayed in character between takes. Rather, he'd run to his trailer and play guitar because he's a, quote, rock and roll machine, not a killing machine. Ted 
Cassidy isn't exactly a household name in modern times, but his monstrous character in The Addams Family absolutely is. Even if the original show only aired between 1964 and 1966, the former radio news reporter beat out more experienced actors for his role on the series because of his massive height. With Cassidy at six feet and nine inches tall, the New York Times called his large stature, quote, the boon and bane of his existence. Lurch's appearance and monotone voice lent itself to the creepy, unsettling undertones that made The Addams Family such a cult hit. According to Legacy.com, the star wasn't meant to have any lines, but ad-libbed his famous catchphrase, You rang. In his audition. Cassidy, who passed away in 1979, might have been tall, but he didn't look anywhere near as ghostly as his infamous character. The star also had roles in McKenna's Gold and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, in which he dressed in western garb and even sported a pretty glorious moustache, which he totally pulled off, by the way. Sundance, when we're done, if he's dead, you're welcome to stay. If there's one evil character that embodies the Insidious series, it's the Bride in Black. The old woman, as she's referred to in the first flick, is dressed in a black wedding dress with stark white skin and dark eyes. If you couldn't have guessed, the man behind the bride isn't trying to steal your soul. In fact, he's a pretty adorable old dude. He's actually played by an actor that used to be on a children's show. The star, Tom Fitzpatrick, had small roles in the Nickelodeon series iCarly and didn't even know what Insidious was when he booked the gig for the second and third films. In an interview with Terror Time, Fitzpatrick admitted he wasn't aware of the outlandish costume he'd be wearing when he first signed up. He said, After the call from my manager, I may have gotten a call from wardrobe, which is standard practice, asking for my sizes. Should I bring shoes, I may have asked. Oh, don't worry. I think they said, you're just going to be wearing pajamas. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more Nicki Swift videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.